All right, guys. So today the goal is we're going to go over all the stuff that we did in class yesterday. And it's a lot of stuff. One of the things I mentioned to you is that France had this weird social class system in place. It's called the estate system. So when you see the word estate in your head, think, oh, he just means social class. And it's weird because the top two social classes consist of either the clergy, meaning people who work for the Roman Catholic Church, like the bishops, the priests, the pope. The second estate is the rich nobles, people who owned a lot of land. These two people, as you'll see in a second, despite having so much power, so much land and so much money, paid zero taxes. That might become problematic. Everyone else you could think of is lumped in at the bottom. And that's a very diverse group of people, right? We call these people the bourgeoisie if they're people who have what you would think of as a middle-class type of job, right? In, in America today, when we think of middle-class job, you might think um, police officer, teacher, doctor, lawyer, right? Maybe lawyers might be upper class, but you kind of get what I'm saying there. So those people are lumped in at the bottom with everybody else. You've got people who are farming for a living, who own no land. We call those people peasants. We have people working in city stores who own no land and make really low wages. These people make up the vast majority of French society, right? That's why social class pyramids are often shaped like that. Fewer people at the top, more people at the bottom. Okay? And it kind of makes sense, hopefully, that the people at the bottom are going to embrace ideas about the Enlightenment, and the people at the top, for the most part, are going to reject ideas about the Enlightenment. So I'd like to kind of think about that critically. You have to think about the Enlightenment and the ideas and, and, may, and then maybe ask yourself, well, why would a poor person want that? And why would somebody at the top reject that? You tell me. Let's start with an easy one. Why would the king of France most likely be unreceptive? Is that a word? Inreceptive? Unreceptive? Non-receptive? That's probably the word. How about just not receptive? Why would the king of France not be so receptive to some enli Enlightenment ideas? Any ideas? Threatens his power, right? Because the Enlightenment people are like, hey, people should have equality, right? Mary Wollstonecraft's like, men and women should be equal. John Locke says, all people are born with rights. Rousseau is like, people should have democracy. If you're the king, that's the last thing you want to hear. Why does the king not want to hear people talking about democracy? Is he going to have absolute power anymore? Absolutely not, pun intended. Okay, so the people at the top are going to reject all these changes and the people at the bottom, if they are the bourgeoisie, the people with an education, they're going to embrace the ideas of the Enlightenment because they're going to say to themselves, hey, I'm stuck on the bottom here. I have an education. I have wealth, but I have no say in my country whatsoever. And John Locke says, if I have no say and if I feel like my rights are being trampled upon, I got to do something about it. So the people at the bottom are going to lead this charge against society, against the top two of these estates. Okay, so we have an example here of inequality. The idea here is, guys, to explain the historical circumstances that led to France having this revolution. So you guys should have open your worksheet for all these documents. I'm going to call on some of you guys to tell me some of the problems that we saw in these documents. All right, so if you had documents set one and you had documents A and B to look at, they were pictures. Can somebody tell me some of the problems that they found in docs A and B here for set one? Unequal distribution of land. 1% of the population own 10% of the land, if you're the clergy. 2% of the nobility own 25% of the land. So I know this is number stuff, this is math. So put these numbers together. 3% of French society control 35% of the land. That means a few rich people owned lots of the country, and a lot of poor people don't own very much at all. Okay, we see this often in history, and, and you're going to learn a little bit later on about the idea of communism and this guy Karl Marx. He says, you could trace a lot of conflict in history back to unequal distribution of wealth. Because if poor people don't get what they think they deserve, they get angry, and we have conflict. Very good, Kayla. What's the problem that we see here in Doc B? commoners are the only one paying taxes. That dark gray in the, in the key for this chart says third estate commoners. So the people at the bottom are the ones with all the tax burden, whereas the people at the top are paying zero. Is that how it works in America? What do we have here, generally speaking? It's called a progressive income tax. And yes, there are exceptions to what I'm about to tell you. If you make a lot of donations, if you have like certain circumstances, let's say, but generally speaking, 
as your income level goes up in America, the amount of taxes you pay also goes up. I pay way more taxes now than I did when I first started my job, for example. Okay, and that's to kind of avoid a situation like this, right? In the name of, I suppose, fairness, right? This was at the time perceived as extremely unfair. So what do we do, right? We study history to try to learn from it and avoid it so we don't have this situation in our country today. So now we have some words, right? Words are fun, but I tried to bold some of the things here to make your life a little bit easier. Can someone tell me a problem that people faced in document C for document set one? Okay, France was targeting people based on religion. When I say the word targeting people, I mean bullying people. And a fancy word that we're gonna use for that in social studies is persecution, right? France was at the time a very Catholic country. The king had a strong relationship with church leaders. They both benefited from each other. So what was a threat to the Catholics? The Protestant Reformation, which we touched upon recently. So that was seen as a threat. The Catholics don't wanna lose members to a competing religion. So what did they do? They went after the Protestants. There was this law that was put in place that allowed for religious freedom, and the king revoked it, meaning took it away. And the Protestants were chased out of France for the most part. So this is a problem if you're a French Protestant, right? If you're being targeted for religious ideas, you're gonna be particularly upset. We learned about an enlightenment philosopher with a certain idea that kind of ties into this a little bit. Do you guys remember what Voltaire's ideas were when it comes to the enlightenment? Freedom of speech, right? And if you were to open up the Bill of Rights to the US Constitution and looked at amendment number one, freedom of, of speech and religion are in the same sentence because it's deemed that religion is a form of speech. And by speech, we mean expression. It's not just what I say, it's how I dress, it's who I choose to worship, okay? So if you're a person in France and you're being persecuted for being a Protestant and you're hearing the ideas of Voltaire in your head, you might start to get some ideas. Maybe you're not so happy with the status quo and you wanna question it, you wanna remove it, and you want your religious freedom. Does that make any sense? Document group two, document A. This is a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Maybe you've heard of him. He was the third president of the United States and he's reflecting back in 1821 on the king. And I know it's kind of a hard document to kind of wrap your head around, hence why I bolded some of the important words here. So how did Thomas Jefferson feel about King Louis XVI? based on the evidence here. Weak leader, right? It says it, right? His mind was weakness itself. His constitution, which in this context, I gave this to you, this is a weird word sometimes. And this constitution equals strength of mind and body. So his strength in mind and body was weak. His judgment was non-existent. Even his queen was arrogant and displayed a sense of superiority. And all he did was surround himself with people like himself, aristocratic people. Right? If you're the king and you're looking to like pass laws for your country, you should probably also surround yourself with people who represent the commoners so you know what their interests are. But no, he just surrounded himself with people just like him, had no sense of what was going on in the streets of France. All he could perceive was prosperity because that's all he surrounded himself with was wealthy people, not the real population of France. Very good. How about this word debt? We talked about it two days ago. That's why we did that vocab do now. You owe somebody money, exactly, right? There were two big D words, debt and deficit. Debt is when you owe people money. Does somebody remember what deficit means? You spend more than you make, right? If you're spending more money than you make and you still have bills to pay, what do you do? You take out your credit card, you swipe, you Apple Pay, bada bing, bada boom, right? Everything's free. No, now you're in debt to, I'm in debt to Visa. So debt and deficits are problematic. And these are some of the things that France did to run up their debt, right? They had to spend ridiculous amounts of money, and they still do, in fact, to keep up the Palace of Versailles, that giant building with all the gold, to takes thousands and thousands of dollars, probably daily, quite frankly, to do that, to keep it up, right? To pay the staff, etc. And then they get involved in some wars. Maybe you guys remember this from middle school, but the French helped us beat the British in the American Revolution. Right, so think about that for a second from the perspective of France. They're spending their money to help out another country. And then imagine if you're a French soldier. You just, go, you just went to fight a war in America to give Americans freedom, and you got back home to France and you don't have your own freedom. Might that make you second guess your own country's government? Perhaps, right? So for a couple of reasons, these wars weren't so great for France. They're spending a lot of money that they don't have. And the people are coming back home and saying, hey, we want rights too. 
that's going to trigger revolution. Never mind the extravagant, meaning super fancy lifestyle of the king and queen, right? Spending the people's tax dollars on having fancy parties, right? If people find out about that, they're gonna be pretty pissed. All right, document group three, if you had document A, it's similar to what we just looked at, okay? Because they were spending so much money on parties and hanging out at the palace. They nicknamed the queen, her name was Marie Antoinette. They called her Madame Deficit. They basically called her the reason for why France is having money problems. Right, just rolling out the dough, spending money that she didn't have, spending the tax dollars of the people, right? The commoners' tax dollars. So again, overspending is problematic. Document B talks about the powers of the king. So if you had document group three, document B, could somebody tell me one problem that people faced in that document? Okay, right, he spent the people's money and completely oblivious to the rising tide of popular discontent. If you're oblivious, it means you don't know what's going on. So you're spending the people's money and you don't know that people are unhappy. That's not great. You should probably know what's going on in the streets. We're gonna learn about the Russian Revolution later. It's the same deal. The royal family is just having parties, living life large, while people are starving in the streets and killing each other. And you're just oblivious to it. Very good. What's another problem here? Another big word that we don't like to see. They put censorship of, uh, um, uh, of speech and press into, into place. You know what speech is, right? You can't bleep and say certain things. What's this? The press? Yeah, in the old days, it would just be the newspapers, right? That's where you got your news. But the people's media now is way more than newspapers, right? It's the internet, it's Snapchat, it's Twitter, it's websites, okay? So when you're censored, it's problematic, right? If there, is pro if there are problems in society and people can't speak out about it, that means those problems just continue. And if you want to be a Protestant and you're told no, that might be problematic. You might decide to rise up. Cool. Document set four. Document A, how Louis obtained money, enough, enough money to govern as he pleased. Part of my, my grammar mess up there. The estates general was an assembly of representatives from all three estates. It was called upon by kings only a few times in French history to approve funding or to discuss a new law. We talked about this the other day, guys. What do we call the group of people in America that gets together to discuss new laws. Congress, right? AKA the legislative branch. So the Estates General was supposed to be a legislative branch for France, but the king had the power to send them home. If he didn't want to listen to them, he didn't have to. What do we call that kind of power again, where the king does not have to listen to anybody? Absolute power, okay? So every time this Estates General was suggested, like, hey king, like maybe you could know our problems if you just met with the Estates General. Maybe we could find a law to fix our country. The king's like, nah, go home, I got this. So if you're a person and you keep seeing that happen time and time again, that the king is not willing to entertain your ideas, you might be upset. Not only is he a weak leader, he seems unreceptive to the ideas of the people. Document B, due to lower than normal temperatures, wheat harvests were in decline, which negatively affected bread production. Simple economics. If we're having a hard time producing bread, therefore there's less bread out there, what's gonna to happen to the price of bread? It's gonna go up, right? Whenever something is in short supply, AKA scarce, and people still want it, it's gonna become expensive, right? The last two years, no one can find PlayStation 5. So if you want a PlayStation 5, you're gonna to have to scalp it, right? Pay whatever, 800 bucks for a PlayStation. That kind of thing. So think about the problems here. If you're a poor French person, you have to pay all the taxes, and now the price of the food has gone up. Out of desperation, you might launch a revolution, okay? Because you can't put food on the table anymore. There are other problems in here as well. Can someone find another problem that the French people faced in this document? Unemployment. This is a weird word. What's unemployment? Someone's not employed, right? So here's a weird sentence, right? If I say unemployment is going up, what am I saying? more people are losing their jobs, okay? And that is what's going on in France. And this is a tough document to kind of understand, but they're blaming the fact that the British are just selling cheap stuff in France. Because what's gonna happen is the British are gonna undergo something called the Industrial Revolution. They're gonna use machines to produce clothing and it's gonna become really, really cheap. And France just starts buying cheap British goods. But if you're a French clothing manufacturer, you're in trouble now because you're ex selling expensive handmade shirts and now no one's buying those shirts anymore. So what happens to you? You lose your business, 
And if you're out of a job, guess what? Unemployment. You kind of with me so far? The next thing I want you to pull up is from yesterday. We just started getting to it. It says, organizer, causes of the French Revolution. It looks like this. And ideally, at this point, we have some grasp on whether something is a social problem, a political problem, an economic problem. And I want you guys to take these phrases and put them in the correct spot. If you see unequal distribution of land ownership, sometimes these things can straddle a line. You might say to yourself, that sounds kind of social, that sounds kind of economic. As long as you can give reason or justify your selection, it's fine. So if you see unequal distribution of land, what kind of problem is that? A social problem. It, it affects people, right? There are rich people, there are poor people. That's a lifestyle difference. So I'm going to put that in social. So I'm going to copy and paste that phrase into my social box. Unequal distribution of land ownership. Could you make a case for another category? All right, because ownership refers to maybe money and owning things, right? So perhaps economic. I'm going to keep it with social for now. But as long as you can make a case for it, you're good. You're Gucci, as they say in France, right? It's a French brand. The commoners could not participate in their own government, right? The members of the third estate, even those people at the bottom, the bourgeoisie, right? Who had middle-class types of jobs, had an education. They could not participate. What kind of problem is this? Political. Perfect, my man. Very good. So I'm going to copy and paste that into the political box. In fact, do me a favor. Next to the word commoners, I want you in parentheses to write third estate. I should have specified that. That's what I mean by the commoners, the people at the bottom of the social class pyramid in France. Only the third estate paid taxes. Where would you put that one? Because it's paying money, right? It's very good. So let's put that there. Only the third estate paid taxes. I think you can make the case. I'm not going to change it, but I think you can make the case for social because it's referring to a specific social class, right? And the inequality between classes. But for the sake of simplicity, if it's got to do with money, let's keep it with economic. Cheap English products led to French businesses failing, right? Because all the French people are like, why would I buy the French thing if I could buy the British thing for cheaper? Sorry, French business, but I'm not coming to you anymore. French business owner goes out of business. Economic is correct. Very good. Poor leadership of the king. Political, right? So I'm going to put this one in the political box. Let's see. The king rarely assembled the estate's general for law approval, right? They had in place this legislative body, supposedly, but the king just kept sending them home. He's like, I don't need your input. I know what all the people need. I don't need you guys. Where would you put this one? This is tricky. Political, yes. Very good. France spent money fighting the American Revolution. Okay, I think you can make a case for that. 100% agreed, right? Because it's got to do with money. For the sake of just making sure everything has a category, where else could this one go? The military. I'm going to put that one in the military just for the sake of since we're dealing with war specifically. High unemployment among the peasants. People are out of work. Economic, right? I have no job. I'm making no money. Very good. Let's see. Ideas of the Enlightenment made people question their status. Wait a second. I don't have the ability to participate in the government. John Locke says, Rousseau says, I should be able to do that. What category might this go in? This is a new category. Intellectual, right? Intellectual is ideas. Ideas have an impact, guys. Very good. Voltaire says, I should have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I'm not getting it. I'm going to question my status now and do something about it. King's power is absolute. Where would you put the king's power is absolute? You're 100% correct. It has to do with government power. Almost there. France spent more money than it collected in taxes. Economic. And maybe you guys can remind me, if I'm, what's that word we're using for when I'm spending more money than I have? Deficit. So I would like you guys to do is, after that phrase, write in the word deficit next to that phrase. Spent more money than you collected in taxes. That's called deficit. And then finally, France spent more money, or rather, France spent money fighting the Seven Years' War. If you guys remember middle school, this was called the French and Indian War. It's the same thing, right? So France is spending its money on a, on a foreign conflict instead of spending money on what they need to be doing at home. I'm never going to ask you about the Seven Years' War, but I'm going to ask you why this is important for the French Revolution. Let's put it in the military, right? Even though it's money, it's a war. I'll put it with military. No, I apologize. I skipped that one. So let's do that. Where did that one go? Edict of Nantes revoked. So if you don't remember the Edict of Nantes, this is the law that guaranteed you religious freedom. And to revoke means take away. So I kind of just gave it away. Where am I putting this one? Uh, in the religious column. Very good. In the religious column, right? Because that denies religious freedom to the French Protestants. 
So what you all need to be doing right now, this is a little bit more of a lengthy do now than you usually get. There's a reading here that's kind of long and then a set of questions that ask you to refer to that reading and also draw upon some of your prior knowledge. So I'm going to let you work on this for a little bit longer than we usually work on a do now. So let's talk about this. So what we did the last two days is we talked about the historical circumstances for the French Revolution taking place, right? Revolution is a massive change. And in this case, it's a war that's going to push for massive change, right? It's a violent revolution against the king and the king's supporters. You don't do that and put your life on the line unless you're really ticked off, right? So we looked at all the things that ticked the French people off. And now we're going to see, okay, well, what actually happens once this revolution gets underway? What steps were taken? How did the French government begin to change? And it went through a lot of changes, some gradual. And then when people feel like the gradual change wasn't enough, they pushed for more radical or extreme and quick changes. So this is a recap of the last two days. Can you guys tell me some of the reasons why France was in some financial trouble? Okay, they had some debt, right? That's, that, that's the financial problem. Can we analyze that and explain what contributed to some of their debt? Okay, right? So let's put debt and then parentheses helped the American Revolution. And you might say, why did they do that? France and England for hundreds of years have hated each other. Right now they get along with everyone's Gucci, as they say. But for a long time, arch rivals. So if France could help us shoot English people, that's what they were going to do. Okay, right? So the government, I'll put in parentheses, royal family, spent a lot of money to maintain... I'll put the word extravagant lifestyle. Okay, right? They imported cheap goods from Britain. Okay, England is a part of the island of Britain, right? So French people like had choices now, which is great for French people in a way, right? I go to a store, I see a cheap English shirt or I see a very expensive handmade French shirt. It's cool that I have access to the cheap goods, but if everyone's buying the cheap British products, what happened to the French businesses? Out of business, right? So the business owners lose their jobs. The people manufacturing the shirts by hand lost their jobs. So unemployment goes up, right? So let's add that as well. Unemployment went up. Yeah, that about covers it, guys, okay? So between the extravagant spending, the spending on wars, the rapid increase in unemployment, France was in really tough economic times. And the king is like, well, I gotta do something. And he floated an idea out there that seems like probably common sense given the context of the situation, right? Can you guys remember how the taxes worked in France before this revolution? Who paid him, who didn't pay him? Only the third estate paid, right? The third estate had some people with money, right? This bourgeoisie group, people who had middle-class types of jobs, they had some cash, but the vast majority of the third estate was poor peasants with no education and no money. So if forcing poor people to pay tax dollars, that's kind of rough. Right? The first two estates did not. So what's the king's solution then to try to generate some more money for the government? Yeah, let's tax the nobility. They're the ones with the money, right? We are in desperate need of cash. We have to put taxes on the nobility and the clergy, the first two estates. They're the ones with the cash. We're in desperate times. You guys got to pay up a little bit. It's only fair. But the nobles don't react well to that. And I know this is kind of a weird thing to think about, but this is the 1700s. Kings are still scared of nobility, right? Nobles are rich landowners. There's always this fear in old times that a rich landowner can go off into the countryside with all their cash, build a castle, hire people to make weapons, hire soldiers, and have a revolution against the king and challenge his power. So there's always this tension between like kings and landowners. How can we make the landowners happy but not too happy? Right, because we got to get something out of them. So the nobles are like, if you want to continue being king and you don't want us to come after you, you're going to have to call up something. You're going to have to call a meeting. And we're going to decide this once and for all what the policy is going to be. What's the name of that group that met that was supposed to approve or disapprove of this new tax? The Estates General, which is something we learned about a couple of days ago. Right, the Estates General was supposed to be the legislative body of France, the group that was supposed to discuss, debate, and propose law to the king. So that's what they do. They have a meeting of the Estates General. They say, okay, we're going to put it to a vote. Should we have taxes on the rich people or not? That's the boiled down version of what the vote was supposed to look like. And the third estate thought, 
this is an unfair structure. This meeting is not fair to us. This, is, this takes some critical thinking. It made you kind of read maybe a little bit closely. The third estate, the vast majority of France, thought this was an unfair meeting. What was unfair about it? Okay, so each estate had one vote at the meeting. Which is weird, right? Because if you went to this meeting house, you would have probably thousands of members from the third estate, maybe not thousands, it's probably an exaggeration, hundreds of members of the third estate, and far fewer rich people, right? Because that's just how France looked. And now they're calling up a meeting, like, you know what? It doesn't matter that there are way more members of the third estate. Each estate's gonna get one vote. So common sense, right? Are you ever in your life, I don't care who you are, are you ever gonna say, you know what? I vote for the government to tax me more. Is anyone ever gonna say that? Probably not. Okay, so the first two estates rejected that. The first two estates could always outvote the third estate. That's how it worked during medieval times. Each group of people got one representative. Not fair, right? Because the third estate had way more people in it. So like, they're like, wait a second, we are like 97% of the population of this country and you're gonna give us one vote on this tax policy? That's kind of bogus. And then that was like the final straw for the poor people of France and the people in the third estate who, you know, has some education, like the bourgeoisie. And they take the first step in the French Revolution. What action or actions were taken by the third estate when they see how unfair this meeting is going down? They created, they called themselves the National Assembly and began making laws for the people of France. So the third estate just says, we are in charge now. They openly say, we are the people, we are the vast majority of France, we are now going to make the laws for the country. And if the king has a problem with that, he could try to come after us. That's a bold move. I suppose what gave him so much confidence was the fact that they had so many people and so many people with the same mindset that something has to change. Okay, but surely the king is not going to go down without a fight. And you'll see shortly that the king starts calling up soldiers, like, listen, like, Go take positions places because I feel like this angry mob is going to try to come after me because they think they're in charge now. All right. So this declaration that they're the official government of France is seen as like the first step in the French Revolution. Right. That would be like saint me saying, you know what? We are the true government of New York State. Albany doesn't matter. Farmingville is now the capital of New York State and we're going to pass all the laws for New York State. Right. That's crazy. Right. I'm sure the governor would have a problem with that and try to shut us down. And that's exactly what the king's going to do. Right? The king's going to say, no, you guys are not in charge. I'm still in charge. And I'm going to have to get my troops together and try to put you down now, put you back into your place. But it's hard to put 97% of your population into place. 